joining us for another episode of Tea and Trowels, the Florida Public Archaeology Network's new web series featuring conversations with archaeologists about their research and what archaeology means to them. I'm Emily Jane Murray, one of your hosts, and today I'm talking with Christopher Altes, who's an archaeologist who works with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Hi, Chris. Thanks for joining us. Hey, MJ. This is uh, fun and different and not, you know, part of the normal deal. So this is really interesting to me. Yeah. Do you want to uh, maybe just take a minute and introduce yourself and then tell us about your mug? I'm Chris Altez. Um, I worked as a archaeologist in the private sector for like 13, 14 years, a couple of different firms. And about two years ago, year and a half ago, started working for the federal government in the planning division of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers so that every um, Every project we do actually has archaeologists attached to it, and that includes normal uh, operations and maintenance work all the way up to major planning studies. And we make sure that the relevant cultural resource laws are followed and uh, complied with as part of these projects. I have a mug right here with some Earl Grey tea. Um, it, we found it in my backyard in my house in Gainesville probably 10 years ago. And so, I guess it's an archaeologist thing not to throw away a mug you find in your backyard, but We're, to clean it and start using it. You say we curate things. Right? That's right. Yeah, exactly. Well, and it, oh, here we go. It's an archaeological concept. It's got now it's enchainment. When I see this mug, it's not just that it's a mug that I use for tea. It reminds me of a house I used to have in a town I was in for grad school where I met a lot of people, where I met my wife. So like there are lots of associations you don't even bring up to this, the forefront. Oh, that's some theoretical nonsense about a mug. That's good. Well, I picked out a special mug because I knew I was talking with you today and it has an dog dogs. on it. Um, yeah. Because you foster dogs and you love I dogs. Do. So love dogs. Awesome. Um, well, I have a couple questions for you. Sure. So why did you decide to be an archaeologist? So I was in college and trying to, like so many people, trying to figure out what I was going to do. I had been a fine art major but was having trouble figuring out how to apply that um, as like a, a, a thing, because I didn't think I wanted to be an artist. And so I started looking at other, got into anthropology and archeology. span Over time, found I really, really liked it. I liked the questions you can ask and different ways of approaching it. Um, I really liked anthropological archeology, span trying to look at, at you know, social, cultural questions um, and using material. Uh, we all joke that we get into it because we're, um, don't like other people, you know, it's better to hang out with the dead than the living. Uh, and I don't think that's always the case for me, but maybe sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm not cut out for uh, long-term ethnographic work or something like that. Um, and I do like just going out in the woods and digging for long periods of time. Uh, and then it kind of just, one thing led to another, did C like I said, did CRM for a while. And that worked and then did grad school and just it kept, it kept feeling like it was right. Um, I'd never had a moment where the skies parted and a sunbeam came down and said, this is what you're doing. But over time, it's just, you can do, you can bring so much to archeology. span So, you know, tech and art and different theoretical perspectives, there's room for so much in there, whatever you're kind of interested in for me, uh, is that can be a little bit of a, of a magpie with my interests and bounce from thing to thing, there is room for it. Um, and it might be that you're doing it wrong and make mistakes by bringing stuff in, but at least then you're maybe moving the conversation along. I don't know. Um, yeah, I always like to joke when I give programs and talk about archeology span that we like to go in and beg, borrow, and steal all of mm -hmm. the ideas from all the other Absolutely. sciences with hard science uh -huh. and social and technology. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, I've got, uh, yeah. I have tons of toys I've taken from other, like that are not intended for archeology span that I've tried to use for archeology. span um, That's fun. Which, uh, well, I realized I didn't even pull all of them out today. Um, so I don't know where they are because my room is in such a state. Let's, let's skip ahead to that question. What is your favorite tool right now? So in my office right now, which is kind of where I'm trapped, I have what I've been playing with most recently. So that's things like a 3D printer, um, the webcam I'm using to talk to you right now, I pulled off a 3D laser scanner um, that I cobbled together a few years ago that I got working but don't really use anymore. Um, on other shelves around here, 
this is a portable terrestrial LIDAR unit. So, you know, spins two ways, collects data, goes to your phone, run by Raspberry Pi. Um, that sort of stuff. Uh, though, honestly, most days, the tool in my toolkit I use is just computers, remote sensing software, GIS. Um, so in that case, it's often, you know, the, the lame thing is like, I use a mouse to do archaeology. Uh, but it's the truth. That's how, that's how I, I approach it these days and have for probably the last five years is most of my archaeology is done from space or airplanes um, <laughs> collecting data. It's not quite as glamorous as, you know, the whip and the hat, but it's better for my, my delicate skin. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, it just shows, you know, once again, the variety of, of different tools we have and that it's not all about getting out and, and finding stuff. It's about kind of taking that data and putting it together and, and figuring out what yeah. it tells us about things. Well, and, and then currently so much of what I do is bound up really in making sure the federal government is, is taking into account historic properties. So that would be sites eligible for the National Register when we're planning projects. So it's not finding out after we've planned the project that, oh, it goes through something important, but trying to find out beforehand so we can design projects around it. And so in that case, really, I mean, that's not something that you, I can necessarily do always boots on the ground, but I need other people to go out and collect the data a lot of times uh, and to sit down and synthesize it and make sure we're taking important archeology span site, archeological sites, historic sites, districts, that sort of thing into consideration before we go out there and say, hey, here's our plan. And uh, you know, while Van is out there doing this, not having the public go, well, we've got you know, a cemetery or a important cultural site right there. Uh, why didn't you take that into consideration? Awesome. Well, that I think was starting to get at your research in 30 seconds. Do you want to? Research in 30 seconds, I think, um, still is mostly, even now, uh, I get excited uh, sometimes talking about fun remote sensing stuff. Um, I like satellites, I like LIDAR, I like trying to make uh, quantitative output from them rather than say, I mean, the thing that I'm so bored with is people throwing a hill shade on LIDAR and going, oh, look, you can see the features. It's like, yeah, but like, give me some kind of quantification of it. Give me some relative elevations, give me some values of, of acreages of, of different identifiable um, features or, you know, break down some multispectral stuff. Um, I saw a report last year, or had a report done, we worked with, with some fun stuff on that in the Everglades, which there's just so much potential for, you know, using landscape classification tools, like you said, beg borrowing and stealing from others, to really get at um, where the archaeology probably is. And that's been my research interest for a while from a technical side. Um, I mean, recently, you know this, I've been getting into printing a lot of stuff and seeing how that goes. Uh, that's less research and more just fun. Chris has done some awesome things. He went from photos of an artifact to a 3D model to a printed model in like, what, 24 hours? <laughs> Not even. So it's so uh, a good friend of, or a contractor I'm working with, who I, who I know quite well, was working on a project in Puerto Rico and said, hey, I found a cool thing. And I was like, well, send me, you know, 20 pictures of it from all sides because I knew I was going out there to Puerto Rico like the next week and sent it. And I was able then that night to make the model, print it overnight, and it was a stamp. So then also use the stamp, you know, first on my person just to see what it would look like because we figure it's a body stamp. Uh, and then on various surfaces to see how the stamp would look. Um, and again, that's going from it being in the field to having a reproduction uh, well, that night and then the next day actually doing kind of the experimental work with it. Um, you know, I had kind of forgotten about that, but that's a good, yeah, that's a, a good fun, th like, I don't think about that because that's not kind of where I think my research goes or where I think my, my what I'm doing in archaeology goes. That's just fun. <laughs> um, that's just kind of interesting for me. I was going to say, uh, I feel like we all have our official duties and then our fun side. Project. That's right. <laughs> Awesome. Um, well, tell us about your uh, best worst field story. So I'm going to blame my friend uh, Yost for this. He took us uh, for his dissertation field work to Middle Caicos, which is a, a small island between uninhabited 
East Caicos and North Caicos, and the Turks and Caicos, kind of right in the middle of them, so south of the Bahamas. And there's not a ton of people on the island. And we set up in a research center for six weeks. It was actually pretty well appointed. And then every day, uh, we would hike out through the brush, through a, a trail we cut that took us a week to cut, um, to the site and do some archaeology and do that basically until we ran out of, of energy and, and time and hike back. And it was, my goodness, I, I was in fantastic shape uh, during that project. However, it was the cutting the trail that did it for me. Great project, great archaeology, terrible poison wood. So poison wood puts out a sap that when it gets on you can cause a mild blister. Uh, earlier, I mentioned that I like to stay inside these days, particularly because I have such delicate skin. I have very delicate skin. Um, a good friend who's an archaeologist said I was the most poorly suited person for doing field work she had met. Uh, so I ended up with both my eyes swollen shut, giant blisters on my face, pop blisters up and down my back and having to go to the clinic the next island over to get a steroid shot. Everyone else just kind of had mild skin irritations like rashes, but somehow during this fantastic field project, just seeing the coolest stuff, great sight, incredible island. You know, it's hard to complain when you, you look out from the site and it's just the, Tur the um, Caicos Bank, which is super shallow water as far as the eye can see, uh, but no, I couldn't look out because my eyes were swollen shut from poison wood from cutting the line in. Uh, so I think that is a, and I've had some miserable kind of field experiences, but that is a best worst, I think, field experience. I think that's, uh, that's uh, yeah, that's a good story. Mm -hmm. uh, it's funny because I think people think archaeology and they think about us going off to these exotic locations and having these crazy experiences. And mm -hmm. um, I've largely just worked in the southeastern United States and I'm like, yeah, you don't have to worry about exotic plants or no, no. iguanas yep. getting stuck in your water pipe and not having water for months or, I don't know, living in jungles. So. <laughs> well, like uh, my, my wife points out, Florida wants to kill you. It Everything does. outside's poisonous. <laughs> you know, I've had a number of times where I've had the my person I'm working with stop me from, you know, walking on a snake or had, you know, we've all had enough tick bites and such to basically get any illness out there. Well, maybe that's my tagline. Florida archaeology, it's wild enough for me right here. <laughs> that's, I mean. So, uh, what, what do you, how do you think archaeology is going to help save the world? What makes all of those ticks and rattlesnakes and poison wood uh, worth it? I mean, this is a, a conversation we actually had a lot of uh, in grad school. Um, I really want to credit uh, uh, Ken Sassman at UF for talking about this kind of thing. Not only saving the world, but kind of what can we do? What can we provide to the conversation? Um, which it's a, you know, archaeology is a way of looking at the material culture to talk about the past. And the past really holds a myriad of ways of doing things of seeing the world, of organizing ourselves, of organizing how we do things socially, economically, of just different ways of seeing things. And we all are trapped in kind of the now and everyone thinks the way we do things or see the world is the only way we can. And archeology span really lets us get beyond that sometimes. And it lets us do that with a narrative, which means it can be approachable to more than just technical folks uh, who are say have a background in archeology. span um, it really gives you a, a, a chance to tell a story about here's another way of doing things dissimilar to what we do, how we do things now and present it in a format that maybe people can understand, can form a bond with and maybe stay with them. I mean, there's so much of what we do now or everything that we do now is a product of kind of our own historical trajectory. And there are others and there's no reason to think we can't bend our, ourselves towards that, towards other possibilities. You know, we see some pretty extreme challenges ahead. I mean, right now I'm talking to you from 50 miles away where I know uh, that's strange uh, because we're both forced to stay in our houses as we've, as we've been discussing earlier. Uh, and, you know, I, I wonder what kind of archeological examples could we find of, of how societies came back from something like this or ways where they didn't just say, well, let's not try that. 
Uh, it really is a storehouse of other ideas and practices for us to kind of query and look at and think about. It provides a way of, of it's a library of ways to think and do things, to put it a couple different ways. Really, Very inelegantly. I, no, I really like that, uh, that metaphor of it being a library and, you know, I think- and it's uh, human, right? Like yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a library of what we've done. Uh, it's not all great. <laughs> a lot of it's not, but sometimes there's a winner and let's not follow the example necessarily of the losers. Yep. Yeah, I like, uh, that's, that's really great. Um, well, one last bonus question. Okay. What's keeping you sane while you're locked in your house? So I've got a foster dog named Bert and he's two and he's uh, basically made out of rubber and springs, we figure. Uh, he just bounces nonstop. And so we spent a lot of time with him, been doing a lot of gardening. Um, my plants are going crazy. Uh, so I'm getting really good growth right now. Trying not to play too many video games and reading. Uh, normally I'd be hanging out with my family or something, but we're all keeping our distance. So it's just my wife and I and a temporary dog. A temporary dog made of springs and rubber. Made of springs, yeah, rubber and springs. Uh, who greatly enjoys just dragging me through uh, the neighborhood. Very good. Well, thanks for uh, chatting with us today. Thanks for having me. And, uh, this is fun. This is a little different, but it's fun. Yeah, yeah. And thanks to everyone for uh, tuning in. And we'll see you next time. Cheers. Bye, guys. Cheers. <laughs>